how nice are you to your colleagues? And by colleagues, I don't mean just the people who work in the same building as you. I mean colleagues in the broader sense. The vet in the clinic down the road. The specialist you refer to, or the vet who refers to you. That student seeing practice with you, your boss, and yes, the person who works in the same building as you. I bet that you're thinking, I'm really nice. I'm professional, supportive when I need to be, and I would never throw a fellow vet under the bus. Except that we do. Our guest for this episode is the Associate Professor Denis Verwilchen. Denis is a double boarded specialist in large animal surgery and equine dentistry. He's currently the clinical director of Goulburn Valley Equine Hospital, which is associated with Melbourne University's vet school. He's a graduate from the University of Ghent in Belgium, with a career that is way too long to list here in detail, which has taken him on a journey through many continents, countries, cultures and clinics, where he has watched teams and the humans within these teams function, or sometimes not function. He's worn multiple metaphorical hats over the two decades of his career, which has allowed him a unique set of insights. And Denis feels that when it comes to collegiality, we can do better. In this conversation, we explore where and how we fall short when it comes to our relationships with each other, including the less obvious ways in which we sometimes disrespect each other. I was going to say screw each other over, but that would be disrespectful. As you'll hear from Denis' story, He's a bit of a high achiever, and he's also married to another super achieving vet. So of course, we had to talk about career goals versus life goals, Denise's thoughts on making major life decisions, the personal cost of chasing your goals, and what he's learned about happiness. Now before we jump in, just a quick heads up on an upcoming event that we'll be involved in. On 23 to 26 March this year, so that's 2023 in case you're listening to this in the distant future, we are doing some more live podcasting at the VEX Spring Symposium in Port Douglas. So that's the Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Society, which is a community of vet professionals who get really excited about everything critical care related. You might have heard about IVEX, the big international ECC conference. So this is sort of a condensed version of that. And for the first time, they're having it right here in Oz. The major theme for the 2023 event is fluid and electrolyte therapy, but there's also a session on Australian snake bites and a great case discussion session with the absolutely world-class speakers. And the Vet Vault has access to them. We'll be there, microphone in hand, with my normal vast level of ignorance and annoying persistence that we'll use to dig deeper into their topics of expertise, live and in person. And we'd love for you to join us. The VEX events are notoriously fun, and Port Douglas in far north Queensland is an exquisite part of the world. And I'm thrilled to be going. Link to book is in the show description wherever you're listening now. Note that this is a VEX members only event, but if you have any interest in ECC, then it's well worth joining. Beyond the huge depth of clinical content, the perks alone make it well worth it. My meditation practice is definitely looking much better since I've joined with the free Headspace subscription that comes with VEX membership. Okay, let's jump in with Dr. Denis. Dr. Denis Favilgen. Am I saying your surname right? Oh, yeah, you're probably doing the best. Favilgen? Favilgen, yeah. Favilgen, thank you. Welcome to the Red Vault. We have a lot to talk about. Should we start with bad decisions lead to good stories? True or false? With an example, if you have one. Yeah, I thought about that one, Hubert, about, you know, what, what would I pick? And I think the, the, there's two that fall in mind. There's the recent one and there's the old one. And I might start with the old one. They're both related. Uh, when I finished my residency and spent about seven or eight years there in, in Belgium at the University in Liège, uh, got the opportunity to go to, to Uppsala in Sweden. And very much without thinking, Gabby and I, who... We had a newborn, King Thomas was a couple of months old. Uh, we sold our house. We put all our belongings into a safeguard and we left for Sweden, like no thinking. And I guess that when you say bad decisions that 
end up good or or odd. I think you don't think about making a bad decision. I don't think there is such a thing as making a bad decision because at the time, every decision you make seems like the good decision anyway. But um, we found ourselves in a, in a different country, different culture, different climate in the sense that when it was summer in Sweden, well, it's pretty much light all the time. So it was quite difficult to deal with. But then also a very, very different work culture and so forth. So I think we, after six months, Gabby and I decided that, you know, that was it. We we wouldn't stay there and, and we packed our stuff and, and came back to more central Europe. So what looked like a good decision initially went out to be, you know, probably a bad one because it was taken a little bit overhauled and full of enthusiasm. And that has happened again with us several times after and and i think most recently after a couple of years in sydney we we went back to europe and got a nice position offered in in germany which then eventually didn't really turn out to be what we were promised not at all to the point that we arrived in a in a clinic in germany and uh, the next day after we were there we were told that that clinic was about to close and if we wouldn't mind moving to another clinic about an hour more south of that. So we were working for a big corporate group and that bad decision of going back to Europe, which we were looking forward at the time because we felt we were far away from family and friends and so forth and was actually quite a good thing because we discovered how much we actually enjoyed living in Australia. And the other thing that I discovered is that I believe more than Gabby, who, by the way, if I talk about Gabby, that's my real better half, the one that pushes me and supports me all the time. And that's a a boarded medicine and emergency critical care specialist for horses. And um, is that there is more to life than work. And I think that's mostly what we learned out of our back and forth trip to, to Europe is that we, we, we've we made another approach to to work and life than we've done for the 20 years before that. And so that ba- what seemed to be a bad decision has actually led to very good self-development and self-awareness in that um, we're back in Australia to live, not necessarily to work. Work has come secondary to the life, which hasn't been the case for 20 years. Now, that's something I definitely want to dig into. But I first want to talk about your, your comments about the good decision, bad decision making. I want to try and figure out if there's a, if there's a takeaway in there for you or for, for listeners. Because we can agonize about big life decisions like this, can't we? Like, do I, do I specialize? Do I move? Do I take that job? Do I do this? And I know from our experience, the several major life decisions, moving countries, selling a business, starting things, and that desire to to know the outcome beforehand and the agony in trying to make that decision. From your what turned out to be bad decisions retrospectively, but with, with certainly with good stories. Do you have a takeaway from that? Something that, that next time you need to make a major decision, how have those experiences influenced how you think about this? Yeah, it's a good one. It's scary, but it's extremely enriching to do them and and I'm very happy that we have you know moved and made the decisions we have made when when we had an opportunity once to go to South Africa country that you know very well mm-hmm. and we've listed the plus and minuses on a really on an excel sheet about different options that yeah. we had <laughs> and South Africa really, you know, had a lot of pluses, both from the work perspective as the life perspective. There was just that one minus that was the security. And so, whereas the balance was like, if you purely made it a mathematical balance, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't add up or it would add up going there. Definitely no questions asked, we're going. Uh, but because there was that, that big minus about security, we we didn't do it. And that was a very calculated choice. 
and that's how we ended up going to Sweden. But that the, the, the Swedish calculation didn't work out either. You know, security was very high. But so I think after that, we've more taken things more from a gut feeling and, and from seeing, yeah, let's just go for the adventure and thinking of it now, I, I, I wouldn't do it any differently. And as an advice to people is if you're if you're thinking that that's what you want to do, you know, I I, I want to go and and go to Australia. I want to go and work in Europe uh, or in New Zealand or wherever, whatever you want to do. Do it now, because by the time you've thought about it too long. It won't happen. It will just not happen. That's exactly what I was wondering when I listened to your story is, is, is that the takeaway is don't. Don't agonize so much. Don't overthink it. And I like their addition about the, the South Africa decision. Is the takeaway from this, unless there's a major reason, like I'm scared I'm going to die, <laughs> I'm sort of a decision in it. Then don't agonize about it so much because really what's do it and what's the worst that can happen and then see it as an experience. You say, well, I'm, well I have a decision making about what to undertake. I have two questions that I've, I set my expectations differently in terms of rather than saying, well, this is going to be a massive financial success or it's going to look like this and this and this. It has to just meet two main criteria. Is what am I going to learn from this? Am I going to learn from it? I don't even know what, but am I going to learn something from it? And what relationships am I going to build from this? Am I going to meet people or am I, is it going to be good for my relationship with my wife or my family? And if it, if those two things tick the boxes, then that's enough to make a decision and go, well, let's let's try this. What's the worst that can happen is it doesn't work and then we make a new decision instead of wanting it. It's almost like with the decision to specialize, which I'll come back to you. Try it. If it doesn't work, then stop it and do something else. Yeah, but that is, that's exactly it, you know, and, and I think in those, we have always looked at, you know, is there any major detrimental factor which in the south african one would be the would be the danger that we considered it not uh, we would have probably done it if we didn't have a kid and then just go for the experience but otherwise we just go and i i remember when we took up the position in sydney it was a, there was a lot of unknowns lot a lot a lot of unknowns and uh uh, we said, well, well, actually, Gabby said because Gabby wanted to go to Australia from from the moment she was a kid, and she said, well, if if that doesn't work out, at least, at least I've been to that country, and I've and I've seen that, and I've ticked that box, and then then we look further. I think there's moments in your life as well where that decision making can change, and what I see now, having a 12 year old in the house, is that the last move we now made going back to to Australia from Germany is definitely the last one we will make for another while, a long, a long while, because I also want to provide some stability to a teenage boy that since he's been born has actually seen pretty much every side of the globe that uh, seen many of the seven wonders of, of the world, which is a fantastic experience from him. They speak several languages. They are, I mean, their development is fantastic. Like, but it comes at a cost for them as well. And now is the time to actually give them some stability. And that would be a major factor. I think whatever opportunity would come our way now to say, to say, no, uh, we're not going to do it. But otherwise, I think, Hubert, whatever doesn't kill you, makes you stronger it's a very cliche saying but it is it is true it is true whatever doesn't kill you eventually makes you stronger and and it develops your vision on things it develops your mind and and body maybe not always so much because you get tired from it as well <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah. but it does you know it does develop your view on things so Jenny, you you mentioned your wife is a double boarded specialist, so ECC and medicine. Yes. And you know slouch yourself. You're also a double boarded specialist, right? You you're a surgeon and a dentist, is that correct? Yes. That's fascinating. The, the I'm very curious always about drive, about professional drive and career, the drive to do well. And then it's interesting that you made the comment that there's more to life 
and I listened to your background, like, oh, it sounds like for a long time, was there anything more to life for you guys than just career? Um, no, no, there, there, and I, I don't really know how it came to that, you know, because, um, first of all, I was a very bad student when I was in high school <laughs> and I've been like, I've been kicked out of schools and I, I was a problematic academic child. So for me to probably have gotten the all the academic tick boxes that one can have now is is quite surprising and I would never have taught it myself but I feel that once you well as well as well in vet school I I did my first year three times because I couldn't be bothered the first year and then I got quite sick in the second year during the exam period so I failed and I had to, I was given the opportunity to do it a third time and then I got going and then I just been flying through. I think I, I found my, found a way of going and then from one thing turned into another, I did some private practice and then was a bit frustrated about not being able to finish up my cases and I thought, okay, let's, uh, I'd rather know a lot about a little than a little about a lot and ended up going back to academia to do a residency. And then I, and then in order to do my residency, I needed to do a master's. That was the, that was the game. So I did a master's and then I got the opportunity to do a PhD. So why not do a PhD? You know, whilst you're busy, just go ahead after the residency or with the residency and then you just keep on i don't know what it is then you just keep on going you just you just keep on keep on going and and with gabby i think it was the same like you you're just having that that hunger to know and that thing about the more you know the more you share which is that is what has probably driven me or definitely driven me to go for the dental boards. And now, to be honest, I didn't do a full residency for the dentistry boards because I was part of the initial pathways where based on my credentials, I was allowed to have access to the exams. And But I still did, I, I sat the whole dentistry exam so I had to study for all and I had to go over all the papers and I had to do the practical exam and everything like that so I wasn't given the thing for free but I just had access to the exam and in a way it doesn't change what I do on a daily basis it has definitely broadened my knowledge on the subject because I studied stuff that I would never have studied otherwise but the main driver I had for doing that was the ability for me to then officially train someone else. So it hasn't been for my own clinical thing. Whereas when I studied for the boards, for the surgery boards and passed the specialists there, which I both have a national, I sat in both a national specialist degree in Belgium and then the European boards, that was mostly for myself like as i want to be a surgeon i want to be a specialist surgeon the dentistry is different my goal was to okay i i have an interest in dentistry i am recognized as part of that group now i want to take the opportunity to formalize that so that eventually i will be able to train people and give other people the opportunity to become specialists in that field that was my only driver so point is, Hubert, there needs to be a drive indeed, but the drivers are not always the same, if that makes sense. That's a great answer. The, the thing I often think about, and, and for selfish reasons or for personal reasons, and then looking at other people early on in their career, is finding that balance between the desire for better, for being better at your job, having more opportunities to, you know, as you say, become a specialist surgeon or to teach somebody else. But balancing that also with the stuff we talk about all the time is giving yourself a little bit of a break, whether that is a physical break or, you know, just don't be so so tough on yourself. Finding that balance between being lazy 
<laughs> and, and still being a motivated person versus somebody who's just go, 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 and never actually has the time to have a life, as you said earlier. Was that a, something you ever struggled with or did you manage that early on? What have you learned in that regard through this massive journey of, the, of two of you, two journeys all in one? That, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> yeah, plus, uh, you know, plus all the international moves and, and two kids and all of that, you know, and some, some pr- other professional challenges that we have taken up, both of us or engagement in college activities and all these things that you that you take on and that you always say yes to the the thing is that for so many years I don't think we had an idea that there was anything else and that that was just our life when I was a resident slash assistant professor in in Liège in Belgium you know we would have 80 to 100 hours work in the clinic uh, a week and then when we'd be at home, we'd be making presentations or writing articles or doing things. I can remember days where we'd finally go driving to family for a weekend and I would be sitting in the back of the car whilst Gabby was driving, correcting exams in the back seat. And that, but that was just life. That was just, if you don't know anything else, then you know, that's how it is. And would I do it any differently? Probably not, because it has worked for many things and and it has brought me a lot of knowledge, a lot of friends, a lot of contacts around the world. It has brought me many, many places and done many, many great things. But the thing I'm I'm looking more at is that it's not a way you can continue your whole life. And I've always been mostly afraid that once I turn whatever age I will be, that I can physically not have the same work pressure, that I don't know what else to do, you know, that I that I just don't know. And so now I'm more and more, you know, trying to build in other stuff and, and have other interests that develop. But um, unfortunately, most of these interests would remain quite work-related in in some way anyway, or veterinary-related or (laughs) work-related. That's the risk. Exactly. I had a conversation last night with an old, I saw an old university friend for the first time in two decades, and talking about people's career journeys and how it went. And we had another friend with us who's from from a different university. And in that conversation, we realized that at our vet school, or at least at the time when I was at at our faculty in South Africa, there was a culture there of vet science. So the study we were doing, that's one part of life. But when we're not doing that, then we're categorically not doing that. So if we had a party or we were camping or we were going for a run or something like that, it was not the done thing to talk about anything vet related which I think was really good for setting the standard for, for a balanced life, for having that surgical incisiveness between there's work, there's life, keep the two apart, don't mix it. And really good for, for building resilience and for getting through tough periods. I can work really hard, but it's okay because when I'm off, I'm off. So it's a good training ground for that. But I do sometimes wonder whether it was also to the detriment of my own and maybe other people's potential, well, potential, their career potential. Because I had that, I was, I was coming out of uni. I had such a very, very strong division between life and work that I went, well, outside of my work hours, I don't actually, I did almost no CPD for a start, which is probably not the best for, for a while <laughs> uh, because I just went, oh, well, I'm not working. I don't want to, anything to do with work. And the idea of studying for something, oh, that, that was, I couldn't even fathom that. Now I'm middle-aged and, and looking back at my career and going, well, what could I have done? And I meet people like you and, and all these incredible people we interview. And you go, well, I could have done a bit more with my career. And I don't know, would I have been happier for it? Or I, it's, I don't have an answer. This is why, why I like to think about these things. But I like your answer of it was a short-term sacrifice with a long-term view to say, well, yeah, I can do this. But, but then I like that you're reevaluating, saying, but this is not sustainable. I've, I've, this is what I've been doing. But being able to then say, well, now let's also try have a life and not just 
not just go 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 all the time i think the the word you're saying that pops in there is trying to have a life because it's, <laughs> it's damn it's it's damn difficult and um you know we've gabby and i've had clashes of culture in that way because when like i said when we were working in liege and doing the residency phd and they had these long hours and then we had this young baby was born he was in in daycare and gabby would sneak out of the clinic to go and breastfeed him a couple of times a day and we'd leave around 6 37 to go and catch him from the daycare last parents picking up the young child and we'd feel we'd feel bad leaving work we had this whether real or perceived perception from colleagues that oh you know now they have a kid they just leave early all the time and like it would be it it, it was a, a strange feeling and then moving to Scandinavia in Uppsala in Sweden at three o'clock I would have people coming at my office looking at me and saying Denis you know you're a young father uh, you have a child at daycare wouldn't it be time thinking for you to pack your stuff and go and you then you know, you'd, you'd feel bad leaving work from another way. You'd feel bad in both situations. You didn't really know how to deal with it. And it was total opposites where the Scandinavian culture is very much not focused on work. They're very much about your family and, and, and about your children. So in a way in Liege, we felt we were bad colleagues and we were bad parents as well because our child stayed at daycare so long. And in in Sweden, we felt as well like you, you, we weren't up to speed because we did leave early or we, you know, they, they, it was a strange thing to have those differences. But on the other hand, like you say, you, you had this clear division as a student between, you know, being a vet and not. One of the things I've, I've always identified myself as a vet from the 1st of January till the 31st of December and having that disconnect is is very very difficult and again my scandinavian colleagues to a certain extent used to be much better at that to a point that it would annoy me and gabby sometimes because they they would leave on holidays and there would still be patients in our care for which we would not necessarily have all the information and then we would call them in the weekend or in the evening or this and that to have a bit more information on a, on a certain patient and that wouldn't be received well because they were off, they were off. So yeah, it felt strange to not being there for your patients anymore. And I'm not saying they're all like that, but that's the experience that we've had. With that was that. the culture. That was the culture. And on the other hand, now I feel we are never off work. Like, we're never, I, I can't, I don't think I'm ever off work. And that also goes with certain roles that you take up. I'm clinical director of the hospital where I work now. I used to be head of a department in Sydney. We used to be head of a clinic in Germany last year. And you have that feeling that even though you're on holiday, even though you're not on call or you have a weekend, you still need to be accessible. I get that, hey. And that's not without consequence, right? No, and that is more, I feel that is more draining for me than to say I'm going to do 100 hours a week and I'm going to write papers and I'm going to do presentations and I'm going to just do cases. But then I'm going to have 24 hours where I can close the iPhone. I can be off this world. But the fact that things just keep on coming from whatever angle, I find that much more draining than anything else. Denis, that's, a, that's one of the main reasons why I decided to sell the, the business I had. Because I, I found that, and I had a very supportive team. Like they were happy. If you speak, if you interviewed them, they'd say, yeah, they never had a boss that t took so much time off for camping trips and family trips. And because that was my goal. So I, I would build the business to be like that. But what annoyed me, then I'd be in freaking Bali on a holiday with my family and I'd be in the surf where I want to be in my happy place. And I'd sit there worrying about some freaking client complaint that I know I'm going back to or 
some staff issue or the fact that I don't have staff. And that I've just drained me, drained me to the point where I was like, I had a great business, but it made me very unhappy. And I, I couldn't actually, well, I couldn't, I could cope with it, but I felt like I didn't want to. I was like, no, it's not how I want it. And I admire people who, who are good leaders and have that ability to, to separate, to go, well, yeah, I've got lots to worry about, but worry about it at the right time. Have you, have you gotten better at that or is it something you're still learning? I'm probably better at it than I used to be, but, but indeed what, what worries me most for the moment is, is, is not my patience or it's not the veterinary part of it. It's, it's more the human resource part of it and, and the management part of it that keeps me awake and that keeps me ruminating. And, and it is one of the things that we actually told about initially having this podcast is about how kind or unkind we are for for each other within the profession and that is potentially what keeps me awake mostly so it's it's not the real it's not the real veterinary thing that pressurizes me the most it is the human nature of the game that i would say i suffer i suffer the most of Quick interruption for some exciting news. You'd have heard me talk about our clinical continuing education podcast in Small East Medicine, Surgery and Emergency and Critical Care that all live at vvn.supercast.com. Now we are thrilled to announce that we're expanding the range with a brand new higher level surgery podcast for vets who are studying for the Australia New Zealand College of Vet Surgeons Surgery Memberships or anyone doing a surgery internship or residency or just anyone wanting to really take their surgery knowledge to the next level. We're partnering with surgeons Dr. Bronwyn Fulligar, Dr. Chris Tan, and Dr. Mark Newman. All amazing surgeons and, more importantly, excellent teachers and mentors to create a one-year program of content based on the Australian New Zealand College of Vet Surgeons membership exam syllabus. We're sticking to what we know, so it'll still be primarily a podcast with the goal that it can be used as a study aid or a revision aid or just an easy way to get stuff into your head and expand your knowledge while you go about your everyday life. We're also planning Q&A and discussion sessions for subscriber with these speakers of ours. And as with all the other clinical podcasts, there will be notes to refer back to for revision or reference. It's still a work in progress with an anticipated launch date late in Feb or early March this year. But in the meantime, if you want to go on the email list to be notified when we do go live and get more information, email us at vetveldpodcast at gmail.com and we will keep you up to date. Okay, back to Denis. We talked so much about the difficulties within the profession, the high burnout rates to even the, the suicide rates and and we put that on this pressure from the clients, this pressure from the patients, the compassion fatigue, the work overload and all of those things. And nowhere in this discussion I ever hear about how unkind and unsupportive we are to each other as vets in this profession in the first place. And I think like if we started to be more friendly to each other, maybe that would be the start, wouldn't it? Instead of blaming the patients and the clients and for all the dramas that we have unfolding on us, I think that wouldn't be a bad thing. Yes. Kindness always goes a long way. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Now we've we've kicked the, the hornet's nest maybe, but that's great. Let's do this. So when you say unkind to each other as vets, what are we? What situations are we talking about? Or is it multifactorial? Are we talking about colleagues within a business? Are we talking about clinics against each other? Are we talking referral versus cheap? Where do you see this as a most poignant problem? Where have you experienced that as a big issue? I think it's a mix of different things. When we treat patients in the first place, as a referral center or, you know, as a specialist, we get a lot of referral things in. And 
I know I have an ethical duty towards my patients and I'm doing what I need to do is, is for my patients. But the person that is sending me that case in the first place for me is a colleague. And collegiality for me is, is high, highly ranked, highly, highly ranked. And that doesn't mean that when you get stuff from somebody else, you, you need to cover up anything that has happened from whatever happens, but you don't throw people under the bus. And, and that happens so much, I feel, in, in our profession about, you know, how Oh, he shouldn't have done that. Oh, Hubert. Oh, yeah, it comes from Hubert. Yeah, yeah, I know now. I know now what the problem <laughs> is. Maybe it is what has come with my development as well as a as a specialist, because I might not have been like that before, because when I, I really know that when I graduated from Ghent University in Belgium as a fresh graduate, I, I knew the truth. Like, things were black and white. And... The whole specialist track and every development that I did, if it has brought me anything, is to know what I don't know. So whatever comes through the door and whatever somebody else has done elsewhere, it's like, yeah, maybe I wouldn't have done it that way. But I wasn't in that person's shoes. I wasn't in that situation at the time. I wasn't the one making that decision there with the information and the environment that was a, that was at my at my disposal. So I feel somewhere we are not very loyal to each other. We're not very collegial to each other in this profession. And I hope, uh, or well, maybe I'm the only one experiencing that and then I'm very happy. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's picking on the knee. <laughs> Yeah, but then that's it. You know, if, if people don't recognize that, I'm very happy if, if that's not what people feel. But if that is what people feel... No, it's a thing. No, I, it's definitely a thing. Yeah. It's, it's not just you, right? It's definitely not just you. I, have, I will say that I have also experienced much kindness from specialists specifically, where, I, where things ended up with them where I did stuff up and they were very kind about it and kept me out of trouble by the way they handled it. I've seen it more with the second opinion case where I, as a GP, I treat something and then it goes to the other GP who doesn't know me and we don't know each other. And then the client comes back and says, well, I went to the other vet and they, was, they said this and this and that. Now, I'm also aware that often the clients might be doing that as a ploy almost to, to get their money back or for something and, and be putting words into the mouth of that colleague. But I have had instances for sure where, where that was the case. So how do we make it better? So A, from what you're saying, we need to be aware of it, right? We need to, when we deal with situations like that, it should be, and I like that you say that front of mind for you is collegiality. Yes, there's professionalism. Yes, there's good medicine. But collegiality should be front of mind. So we think about it as, as step one. But how do we talk about it? How do you handle that situation? Let's say you get a horse into you that it hasn't been handled correctly and the treatment needs to change you need to do something differently and you need to explain it to the client. How do you explain that in a way that doesn't throw the colleague under the bus, but is not false with false information, lying, covering us and, and not unprofessional? Well, I mean, I'm literally looking for a script here or for words that you use to, to do this effectively. <laughs> it's very, it's, it's very difficult because it's very situational dependent on, you know, what has happened or, or how it goes. But first of all, you try to get the information from the source initially. So, if they're, because you know, you know as well that, like you just said, it could be what the owner's report might not actually be what the vet has advised. And then we do advise a lot of things to our clients as well that never happen, right? So, yeah. and uh, well, I can remember one from last week again that I saw after at an eight week checkup where I had advised putting on specific farriery and a specific type of bandaging and it comes after for eight weeks and it hasn't, it has had neither of these things, 
And that's, you know, my own case with my own advice where the client has just neglected. The only thing has come has come after eight weeks to seeing that the horse is still not better, but how do you want it to be better if you haven't done what I asked you to do? Yeah. So there's, there's that it's figuring out and talking to the colleague directly looking at what have been the circumstances in, in which that happened. And often when you have that, you start understanding why the things haven't been done like it should have been. You know, we could get horses in that have a ruptured stomach that are referred in for colic that have a ruptured stomach. And you'd say, why did the vet not put a stomach tube? Like, come on, you should put a stomach tube. How, how yeah. you know, this first first thing you learn in vet school, put a stomach tube, come on. Yeah. So you can have that attitude. But then when you ring the colleague and you say, this and this is what, and and that colleague says, yeah, you know, I'm very sorry. I was thinking of passing a stomach tube, but I was in the middle of a field in the mud, in the rain, with the floods, uh, with a 16-year-old that was unable to hold his horse, with a horse that was rearing up. The best thing I thought was I just, I can't examine that horse here and I can't do the right thing. I need to refer it. Well, that's very valid information that you can bring up with the owner and say, why? Because the owner is going to ask, why did this happen? Well, you'd say, well, ideally, indeed, it should have had a tube. But your vet has referred your horse here just exactly because of that, because he wasn't able to do in those circumstances that he was put in what he needed to do. And so now you're here. And yes, your horse has a bad outcome. But that is not due to a mistake from your vet. That is due to circumstances. And if you don't know these circumstances, you may make comments to that client that throw your vet under a bus. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, I, I obviously working in emergency for the last decade and some, it's a common thing. It's not a second opinion. It's just that the thing that your colleague saw earlier today is now much worse and now it's at my door. And it, it, I used to have that judgment of going, oh, come on, you should have fucking just, I, exactly like the stomach tube situation. You, why did you do this or something? But I've left that because exactly over time, speaking to people and getting the full story, there's almost always a story, even if it is just that I was too busy or I was just tired or I just, you know, humans are humans. You, you do miss stuff. Sometimes it is a, it's an education issue. So sometimes when you speak to people, there is a, I didn't, I didn't know. I'm, I haven't seen these cases before. And then it's a, an educate with kindness to say, well, here we go. This is what happened. It wasn't ideal. These are the things we would normally look out for, but, but not, but to the client, especially, Hey, don't say anything to the client unless they ask. And when they, they will often ask in emergency, they'll often say, well, why didn't my vet X, Y, and Z? And the answer to me is always just, yeah, keep in mind, it's very easy for me now to make this diagnosis because things have progressed. If I was your vet eight hours ago, I probably wouldn't have done this. I probably would have done the same. I could have, we could have done this and this, but it's very easy for me to say in retrospect. And I'll say it outright. So I'll say, by all means, ask them. But, but I imagine eight hours ago, this was a very different situation. So don't make assumptions. And I'll, So I'll, I will actively defend vets. Not lie, but, <laughs> but defend them for sure. <laughs> but but that is the that's the difficulty, yeah, Hubert. There is sometimes, you know, it's a fine line between lying or or covering up and defending or being collegial sometimes. Yeah. And like like you said, the easiest thing is when you have a client that doesn't ask the questions. It's more much more difficult when when you have clients that ask the answer, like Doc, oh, hey Doc, was there really a, nothing else we could have done? And and you you have that sometimes you you know you have I mean fractures in in dogs and cats is a bit different because you just put them in the back of a car and but um, I sometimes get X-rays from non-displaced close non-displaced fractures uh, or horses come and then they are they arrive in hospital and everything is open and and you know comminuted open fracture and you have to euthanize the animal because the vet simply hasn't immobilized they didn't bother to put a splint or to put to put a bandage for referral and and something that could have been repaired now turns out to be unrepairable and when you then get the question is there anything more that we could have done it's sometimes very difficult to have an answer to that question but again that, that without going into specifics i think the message for 
for us as a community is to be thinking about those things, whether you're a specialist or whether you're a GP. And in my mind, a GP is a specialist of its own kind as well, because I have a lot of respect for GPs because they have chosen the path that I haven't chosen, which is to know a little bit about a lot of things, a lot of things. I know a lot about very little. But the the thing I would say to GPs is your best knowledge and your best skill is a good contact book. It's a good, it is knowing where and when your knowledge or capabilities stop and where that of somebody else starts. And I have so much respect for those that have that ability and then call me or another specialist to say, hey, I have this case before sending it to you. What should I do? I have this fracture. And is there anything that could be done? And and how should I send it and refer it to you so it has the maximum chances of still being treatable when it arrives at your referral center? And that's the kind of communication I feel we should have as well. And that is kindness and collegiality with each other, that collaborative way. But we are, to a certain extent, far too commercial as well into, oh, let me treat it myself until uh, I can't do any more because I'm afraid of losing the client because if I send it to that clinic, it's not going to come back. Or the referral clinic, oh, I have a case and I'm not going to send it back. So, I, Yeah, commercial is an aspect. I'm trying to... Be self-critical and think of cases that I haven't referred over the years that I should have. Part of it's probably ego, a little bit of like, well, I I want to fix this. I can, I want to figure it out. I want to make it happen. Just, you know, you don't want to give up on a case and, until it's too late and you go, oh, shit, I should have just sent this ages ago. So it wasn't always fun. Okay, in the days when I wasn't a practice owner, I had no direct personal financial benefit to keeping it. I just wanted to fix it and dry stuff. And it's a pro- it's ignorance. It's ignorance as to uh, exactly that, not knowing what you don't know. So you treat and you blunder forward and you do stuff and it starts going wrong. And probably with, with more experience, I now know much sooner when it's go- starting to go south. I start recognizing going, oh, this, is, this isn't good anymore. This is beyond me. And let's make it somebody smarter's problem. So it, I think it's an experience thing as well, learning. It's, it's not always doing it almost maliciously and it is and and you know but it is not only that it's not only from gp to specialist or 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 vice versa it's some it's also between specialists or between specialisms and between specialists and you know i've seen that in very much in in very many places that this attitude of it's my case it's my case so i'm gonna deal with my case I'm a surgeon and I have a post-op colleague, but I will deal with it. I have a specialist in medicine or emergency critical care in the house, but I'm not going to ask his opinion because it's my case. So Because it's ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely ego-driven. And that is a thing. It is to... The, the biggest skill is eventually admitting that you don't know, and that's damn difficult damn difficult Mm -hmm. and and i am i am very much aware of it myself and even then i find it difficult sometimes that i'm like ah you know i (laughs) should just did it again didn't he yeah Yeah, did again (laughs) yeah i'm sitting here trying to figure out why why do we do the throwing under the bus thing like what it makes no sense at all like if i think if you ask anybody reasonable if i sat down here with another bed and they'd say oh no no i wouldn't I wouldn't do that. That's a dick thing to do. And yet we do it all the time. And I, th- I think ego is the answer. And I'm going to say this. Maybe people think about this and they might be offended. But ego in two ways. You're either doing it because I feel so shit about myself that I need to put somebody else down, the colleague whose patient I'm seeing. I need to put them down so that I feel better and look better, which is really toxic. Or I think so much of myself that I think I'm the only one with a valid opinion and I'm the only one who knows what to do, which is equally, it's equally shit, really, isn't it? I don't know. I'm sure there's more to it, but that's what I get to now. Maybe if you think about it that way to go, before I badmouth that client, before I say that 
snarky comment to my nurse even about the comment never mind the client try and look at why am i why am i about to say this what is it about me that makes me feel like i need to put down somebody else well if you're in the latter category of the one that you know thinks so highly of himself that he's the only one that's right i think you can't be held to you um <laughs> and and i truly think that that category does exist but it's a very small proportion i think mostly when i make bad decisions i make these decisions is because i'm in an area where i am insecure about myself and in the areas and the domains i know my shit when i really know my shit i am much more amenable to actually accept that i don't know if that makes sense yeah 100% makes sense 100% makes sense yeah well it's because you know you know enough to know what you don't know that's that's what i'm learning with emergency the more i learn about emergency the more i go oh I was a fool for the first 10 years about this particular thing. Like I thought I knew and I just, I just didn't know. And that's because you're hanging on so much onto the only truth you have available. And the more you know about a subject and the more experience you have in a subject, the more you realize there is no such thing as black and white. And there's so many shades of gray available, even more than 50 that, <laughs> that you look at the thing in a whole different way. And so when it doesn't really fit your box, you're much more able to say, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it could be or it could not. And sometimes that has actually clashed myself back into my face because people come after as a third, fourth, fifth opinion, they come to a specialist and they really have that expectation that you're going to solve the problem. And here they are meeting this specialist that is scratching his head saying, oh yeah, maybe, maybe not. And they look at you like, aren't you the one that's supposed to know? And you're, <laughs> you're <insane>. like, <laughs> you're like, no. And then they come back and they say, but, my vet that I saw there, he knew what it was. Like, well, if he did, you wouldn't be here, would you? So I think the large proportion of people that have that is more about insecurity about their own black and white knowledge or, or lack of perspective. And again, I say it again, the, the more I've gone down the track of, of development, of self-development, the more I realize that there are so many things I don't know. Denis, so we've talked about the probably the most easy scenario for most of us, myself and most of our listeners who are mostly going to be GPs or non-specialists. Is that thinking of, which, cause talking about practical ways to be more kind to each other, is the specialist being kind to the referring vet or the second opinion being kind to the first opinion vet? Do you see it the other way around? But like basically, the, I think my question is how should how should GPs be kinder to specialists? Are you, do you get scenarios like that as well, where people burn you, even as the specialist vet? Yeah, I mean it goes both ways, and, and like it goes in between specialists as well. As although I think that between specialists, I feel there's less of that because most of us or most of us that have been specialists for a while do do realize that. Yeah, I can see it as well from from the perspective of GPs. I can think of a recent case that we have a you know a mayor coming in with a dystocia and they send it in, you know, obviously to get the fallout. Hopefully it's alive. It is sent in as being mentioned it is alive on referral, but stuck, you know, so has to come out. And I'm so proud of my team because in, in about 20, it was 23 minutes. I saw the float coming on the parking and I looked at my watch. And when I looked at the watch again, when they were resu attempting to resuscitate the fall, it was 23 minutes later. And I thought I was an amazing effort from the team, meaning there had been a specialist team from reproduction trying to vaginally deliver the the mayor, there was anesthesia that was putting the horse down. There was a surgical team with the whole abdomen clipped and washed and prepped and a surgeon gown to be ready to do a C-section. 
which didn't need to happen because they vaginally delivered. And then the ECC team medicine resuscitating the fall. And the owner got a bill for three and a half thousand for that, which is ridiculous money. Ridiculous low, low money? I hope, you, I hope you mean ridiculous low. Is that what you mean by ridiculous? Yeah, it's ridiculously low money for what has happened. Yeah. And she complained it was too expensive. And her GP backed her up in that and said, yeah, they shouldn't have charged this. And, you know, why did they resuscitate the fall? They could try to resuscitate the fall and, and things like that because it was dead. And, you know, well, then don't send it in, you know, then we don't. So my whole proudness of my team fell apart by these comments from the clients and then this backing up of the GP mostly that I that I would have hoped and expected the GP to to say yeah no that's the way it is and actually you know I've, you, I would have expected the bill to be twice as much or, or more for what they did and what they tried but but that wasn't the case so it goes both ways yeah so supporting the, the specialist and I think again that comes from a lack of understanding having been on both sides of that of that spectrum so again an emergency that's a common thing are you guys over happy that you're there but emergency clinics overcharge they charge too much why is that twice as much i can do a c-section for x you do it for 2x that doesn't make any sense that's just that's just gouging that's that's unethical uh, that gets bandied about maybe not directly to the client but certainly gets said behind the hands <laughs> but the thing is i have been the gp vet with that lack of understanding. So I used to, we used to get our patients back from the university and see those bills and go, ah, we could have done that. We could have done the whole surgery for what you guys spent on just stabilizing the thing. That's ridiculous. And I, I, I mean, I was never mean enough to say it to a client, but it certainly bothered me. And I certainly bitched about it to my colleagues, but it was lack of understanding, not, not understanding the economics or the, or the service, the level of service, as you say. Well, you know, one of the things that I've sometimes thought about, because I've I've had friends and, you know, good friends that graduated together with me and that directly went into private practice and now have a bank account 20 years later that is much, much bigger than, <laughs> than mine. Than yours. <laughs> I, that's m much healthier than mine. And, and I have one that just sold his practice in Belgium and to a corporate and you know, he's worked, he's worked damn hard. He's worked damn hard and I give it to him. Like I'm very proud of him and I, it, it's whatever, don't get me wrong in what I'm saying, but I look at what he's built commercially and what he, he got for it. And then I am there 20 years later with all my titles and all my education. And I have none of that. And when I try to charge more because I'm a specialist and that people come to me for my advice, they don't want to pay for it. Like they don't want to pay for it because they don't see the difference. And somewhere that's a bit of a kick in the nuts. Uh, it's a bit of a kick in the nuts. Yeah. Or, or it could have to do with my ego again. But then again, I, I never did what I did for the commercial aspect of it or for the financial aspect of it, but it's a bit disappointing. And and it, this is also a very difficult discussion because this comes like in the human field. If you go down the path of cardiology or surgery or whatever, the guy that sat beside you in college is, is and that didn't go down the specialist track is not allowed to do what you're doing. But... Everyone that is out there that hasn't followed a specialist track is actually allowed legally, technically to do exactly the same thing that we do. And in Belgium, you also had that unkindness in financial competition. I don't know how exactly it is here in Australia in that sense, but you had a lot of GPs going and doing arthroscopies in horses for, for no money, like no money because they just thought it was fun and they would do they did have a little backyard OR and they drop a horse in a recovery box and they just do and have a bit of fun and dramatically undercutting the price and taking away the bread and butter for more specialist centers and that's also unkindness to the profession that is also unkindness and disrespect towards other people that have 
put in a lot of effort and personal sacrifice into obtaining those credentials and this development and level of skills and knowledge to perform a very limited number of acts. Because by taking that away, you know, they're also taking and, and undercutting the price from it, from it. I also consider that uncollegiality. If, if, I hope you see where I'm coming from. I am. It's a light bulb for me because I've never thought of it like that. Because the odds are, I like to always look at motivations of why people do things. From the perspective of the guy undercharging, it's either going to be economically driven. So that's a that's not a, a noble driver, but I, I'm going to undercut you so I can do more so I can make more money and you don't get the money. Or as you say, they're doing it out of a, a curiosity or, or, or sometimes from what they perceive and what they believe and what is to some degree as a service to go, well, these things need to get done. Not everybody can afford specialist bills and I signed up to fix animals. So I'm going to fix it at a price that I think people can afford. So they come of it. Come, I've certainly done that where you, you come at it from a place of what I think is heroic almost, but I've never considered it that I'm actually being a dick to the person who is really skilled at doing it and charges a decent price for it. There is a, an aspect to it that I've never actually considered. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Well, the first thing, Hubert, is that I don't always consider myself a specialist. I'm just a trained surgeon, you know, with all respect to people. When you graduate from vet college, you're not a surgeon. You're, I mean, you're you're not trained to be doing surgery in, in all these things. Like... We, we are miles apart from human specialization and in veterinary specialization. I think in small animals, yes, you have more of those people that will focus on the left stifle, right? And that only do surgery of the left stifle. But I go from an abdominal surgery to an upper airway, to an arthroscopy, to a fracture fixation, to pulling a tooth, to doing that. Like I'm a trained surgeon. That's what I am. I'm not, I, I, yes, I have specialist credentials, but I, I have learned how to do this. And the difficulty sometimes as a specialist or as a trained surgeon is that anybody that graduated together with you has the same rights and the same possibilities of doing what you do without restrictions and without having had that training, if, they, if that makes sense. I, I would like to throw this scenario at you. If you have some joint pain, like your knees hurting, you just went running and your knees hurting, and you go to your GP as a first instance, and lovely lady, she is your GP. Like she's fantastic and she's she's very good, and she examines you very well. And she said, "Well, uh, your knee seems a bit puffy there, and and ah." Uh, you may have a meniscal tear and stuff like that. And she shouts to the background to, <laughs> to her husband that helps her in the practice. And she said, John, could you clean up the kitchen? Because we're having an arthroscopy this afternoon. <laughs> I think you'll run out very quickly, <laughs> even with your sore knee. But this is reality. Yeah. This is reality in our profession. It's changing for sure. I, I maybe I, I, I the circles where I move in, but I did, I, I do feel it. I'm sure it still happens, and sometimes it happens through necessity because you are the only vet for forever, especially in Australia. So you do it in the kitchen, or it doesn't get done, and you do your best at it. But I think the the younger generation are, are much more prone to going. Well, if there's better available, I'm going to offer better. If they don't accept better, well, then I do my best with what I have. Do you agree? Do you, do you feel like, or, or is, it, is that a, a smallest thing again? Do you still have a lot of that going on in equine? I think you have much more of that going on in equine and even much more of that going on in farm animal, which is a good thing because exactly as you say, you have to look at the circumstances as well. And if you're a human doctor in certain and I don't like to use the word third world countries, but less, or as the WHO says it, countries with restricted medical resources, this might still be the situation as a GP human as well, right? 
it could be exactly yeah, there. Yeah, and right. that's that's what you're going to get. And I always say, if I go out on a trip in Bush, Australia, in the middle of nowhere, first equine facility is at 24 hours truck drive. And I have a horse with colic that has a surgical diagnosis that needs to be opened. And the only thing is I have is a Swiss knife and some baling twine. I'll get some hot water and let's open it because that's the best chance that animal there here and there will have. Because if I don't do anything, it's dead and it might die with my intervention. As long as I can humanely help that animal, I feel I have a duty to do it. But if I am in center Sydney and I have a hospital at 20 minutes drive, that same approach is unacceptable. Yeah, suddenly your bailing twine is not as attractive anymore, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But um, yeah, I don't know how we got into that now. No, no, that's gold. I'm, I'm also thinking that, that, <laughs> that was, it's been a good journey, but I think it's very essential. We've not discussed this before and I've not actually thought about it that much and in the way that you express it. And I think it's a vital conversation. Kindness to kindness to colleagues is how we got into this. And we're talking about how, yeah. what does kindness look like? And this is a kind of a, kind collegiality that I've not considered. So thank you for, for bringing that to my attention. The other thing I thought I we had talked about that I wanted to discuss with you was the concept of happiness. Mm -hmm. I have it written down. What does it bring up to you? What is happiness for you? Oh, that's a question. Are we talking, so I always, I'm always mindful this podcast is for vets, but are we also humans? Because I often try to define what the vet vault is. And in summary, why do we do the vet vault? It is, and, and I sometimes struggle with the correct words. It is to help veterinarians create X kind of lives around their veterinary degrees. But what's the word for the X? It's thriving, sustainable. And really, the, the word that I always want to start with is happy careers. We want vets to be able to build happy careers and lives around their veterinary degrees. But I don't use happy because what does happy look like? What does happy mean? It's such a slippery term. So what does happy mean for me? I think it's an individual thing. I think it depends on your values. It depends on what's important to you. What does happy mean for you? So I, for personally, it is autonomy, peace of mind. Peace of mind for me is happiness, right? So I could be, like I said, when I was surfing in Bali in, the, in my happy place, I wasn't happy because I didn't have peace of mind many times. So how do I achieve that? Now, that's the question. What, is, what does happy look like to Denis? Yeah, happy is the same thing. You know, for me, it's happy is, is exactly like you say. It's being in that happy place where you feel safe, where you feel loved, where you feel respected, maybe where, you're, where your ego is brushed in the, in the <laughs> right direction. But above all, I think for me, happiness is reality minus expectations. And I... I don't know where I got that saying from or, or wherever it has been, but it has stuck with me for a long time and it has proven to be a very valuable definition when I feel unhappy and that I look actually at what actually were my expectations of the situations and, and how that met reality. And very simply, you can apply that in a lot of situations. If you whether it is you go to a restaurant and, and you know, you have the, the most fantastic dinner you've ever had and, and generally you go away and you talk to family and friends about it and, and you, you just go and make something out of it. It was just the most fantastic place you've ever eaten. And then sometime later you go back there and it's so disappointing. It's not. And the thing is the same. And it's still a fantastic restaurant, but your expectation of it has changed very, very much and is very different than the reality. And the re but the reality hasn't changed. And so all of a sudden, you're not happy with the same situation. So when I am in that situation where I feel I'm not happy with this, then I think, you know, what was actually my expectation compared to the reality? And this is a thing that is also when we were initially talking about, you know, our journey and, and Gabby and I looking more at, at life than work now, 
every move we have made before this one or before the last one we did back to Australia has always been for work reasons. When even though it was Belgian, when I moved to take up my residency in Liège University, it was for work. When we moved to Sweden for work, to Copenhagen for work, to Sydney for work, back to Germany for work. But when we decided to come back to Australia, the driving reason was life. Saying we want to live in Australia. We want to settle our family and develop our family in Australia. And although work is an integral part of our life, work comes second. So now the dramas and difficulties I encounter at work are not any different than they have been anywhere else. But I can, I'm much more happy about it because it doesn't define my expectations of life as much anymore as it used to before. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so did you change your expectations of what work should be or, or what, what it should look like? The story, the new story of what work should be? Yes. I have changed my expectations of, and it's a very bad thing to say or very arrogant thing to say i don't know don't please anybody that listens don't take this badly but i've changed my expectations of what i can expect from people around me very very much very much and i've realized i am not having the same expectations anymore from people i have i've had and and that means that i'm much less disappointed in what happens or what doesn't happen and that I can't have the same expectations for them as I have for me. So those expectations have dramatically changed and that makes me much calmer and much happier in a way. I think it's very wise. I don't think there's anything offensive in that. I've seen people struggle with that. I think this is one thing I am fairly good at. I've for a long time, I've, I've realized that humans are very human. So whether we're talking about my colleagues, my clients, my kids, my friends, I, I appreciate that humans are amazing and we're also very self-centered, short-sighted. Uh, we can be both those things simultaneously. So I, I don't get upset by clients. You know, you know, it's a big thing in our profession, complaining about clients. They don't bother me because I expect it from them. I expect that, well, we're going to get emotional about these sort of things and that's human nature and it's, it's not my fault. So I'm not going to get upset because you being rude or something like that, because it's half expected. But also realizing that, and there's a risk in that, because if you expect that all clients are going to be difficult and grumpy, then you're probably going to have a, the wrong attitude going into your interaction. So, so I don't, I'm trying to rephrase that. I go into interactions with humans expecting the best of it to some degree, but also being aware that it's unlikely to always be the best. So I'm unsurprised when it's not great. So I go in there with the right attitude. I expect that we're going to be friends. I expect it's going to go well, but partially also expecting that at some point it's going to fall apart. I mean, that works in your marriage. That works in, it works in everything, works with your colleagues. I, I don't, when I ran the, the hospital, when I had a team and you deal with other managers who get really angry when something isn't done right. You know, this, somebody forgot to do this. The nurse didn't do this. One of the vets neglected this. And they get really upset about it and almost take it personally and want to have a witch hunt about it and repercussions. And I was always like, no, we've got to deal with it. We've got to educate and re-educate. But I'm not surprised because I'm working with a bunch of humans and sometimes they come in with a headache and sometimes they don't have enough sleep and sometimes they just don't give a fuck because sometimes humans just don't give a fuck. <laughs> but it's unsurprising. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. It's just human nature and and... That is, it's one of the things I have, is that apart from my veterinary development career, I, I have been very lucky both in, or in several places, like in, in Copenhagen, I did a lot of leadership development courses. I, I had a personal coach when I was in Sydney that, you know, helped me navigate through the system. And, and I did a lot of personal development there as well. And so I've, I've had 
opportunities a lot to develop myself as well from the managerial and, and personal aspects of things. And where I have both discovered a lot about myself and a lot about human nature. And actually, I find I find human nature very, very fascinating. And I, I find myself sometimes very fascinating because in my whole mindfulness journey, I have sometimes what I see, what I see is that I'm, uh, I'm much more aware of what I think and how I feel. And sometimes I have this conflicting thing inside and people are going to think I'm crazy because I'm admitting that I have two voices in my head. So I should be internalized. <laughs> Somebody should call an ambulance for them to pick me up here. Uh, and get the the white jacket with the hands crossed behind. But I hear that other voice say, why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? So I am much more self-aware than I used to be much more. And I think that fits into the mindfulness thing. I think, does it tie in with your expectations of other people are based on your mindfulness and the realization of your own nature, of your own human nature. So it makes it, having mindfulness of yes. yourself it, it makes it much easier to be kinder and gentler and more more um, forgiving of other people because you realize that I, my wife and I always joke because we always we have this thing that when we meet other people, you have dinner with a couple or something and, and you start to get to know each other and each other's intricacies and oddities. And then, of course, we're always right. When we, when we discuss it together, we're like, <laughs> we have all the right ideas. We're like, uh, but we joke about it because we know that to the, they're probably at home talking about how crazy we are. And <laughs> so that realization that we're all crazy in our own special way is crazy and messed up, and but yet also amazing and full of potential is a big realization for me personally. Yeah, yeah, but but it is also like you say, human trying to put things into perspective of like you say, why people do certain things or they don't do other things. I can remember one of our our technical staff lately complaining about uh, we we've put these big uh, containers outside for the interns to put in reflux into so it can be you know not thrown into into the gutter and contaminate the gut but just being disposed of in a more proper way and uh, one morning they found the containers full till like just a beer like you would like to have your beer filled like just <laughs> just till, till the very very top and <laughs> and he went like ah I, like i'm not gonna repeat the words he said but he wasn't very kind to them <laughs> and and i reflected on it and i said you know yes right but do you remember these guys are how many hours these guys do on a day and on a week and and you know how they go about it and when you're in the middle of the night trying to deal with all these these patients and and running around you're you're not in the same state of mind so these are all very smart people that do very stupid things yeah because of circumstances because of circumstances and if you halt for a moment and think of that you can't get upset you say okay we need to find another way that is that is more idiot proof, if I may use that yeah. word. Yeah, so this doesn't happen again with the chance that it will happen again, even with a more idiot proof system, recognizing that it is not these people being stupid, but just the circumstances that lead them to act in the way they are acting. And that will work for 99% of people. There's a subpopulation of people that may just be stupid or may have other circumstances, attenuating <laughs> circumstances. Be malicious. There's, there's some, sometimes there's malice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. but. And I think it's important to accentuate why we talk about this. Because I think it's people, people can misunderstand it as saying, well, you should just let other people off the hook and let them get away with stuff and not be accountable for things. No. No, 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 no. That's not what we say. We do this for ourselves because you, you still need to do the things you need to do, but you can do it without being angry all the time <laughs> because if you, if we, because you have those expectations, you're just going to be angry and you're going to do a worse job of it. 
Yeah, and that's, you know, that person that's done that, I will still question them and still ask them, why did you do that? Like, look at this, you know, why do you think this is okay? But I will not eat myself from the inside and think like, how how stupid can you be or whatever, you know, this kind of self-destruction and, and because I'm trying to find a way to understand why people came to that decision or that thing that they did. And sometimes I, it, it, sometimes I can't find why, I can't find why people do certain things and then I get upset. I think I just realized how I learned this lesson, how this became a thing for me. With my firstborn child, I did all the reading about sleep training and books and, you know, I was well prepared. I was scientific about this. And I had this expectation that when I follow the right steps, that my baby will sleep through the night by about three months, six months, whatever. And did he do it? Of course not. He would sleep through the night for a little bit and then something would change. And I would investigate it like a clinical case. <laughs> Why is he not sleeping? I'm going to find the solution for this. And my mindset around that, based on that expectation that my baby at this age should be sleeping through the night, made me really unhappy. I was angry at, at my child for not sleeping through the night because my expectation was that you should sleep through the night because I'm doing all the right stuff. So why the fuck are you not sleeping through the night? And, when I, and, I, and it took me the second child to realize, let go of that expectation. Sometimes babies don't sleep and we don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. Extrapolate that to human. That's a little human. Extrapolate that to an adult human. Same thing. Sometimes we act in ways that are not rational if you expect rational behavior from humans all the time, you're going to be angry all the time. So let it go. Let go of the expectation. <laughs> but I, I hear something else there, Hubert. I hear something else which has come out of many personal development things that I've done and coaching together with Gabby and things like that. Is this inherent wish for us males, apparently, and maybe even more accentuated in those that have a surgical wish or background is the, the willingness to fix things. And so what you've just described to me, what I hear there is, yeah, you have that expectation for the kid to be sleeping. And mostly what you're trying to do is fix his sleep. You're very focused on fixing his sleep and you get frustrated because you can't bloody fix the thing. Yeah. And I see that in the relationship I have with Gabby or with other things as well, is I'm, I'm often trying to fix things. And there's a very nice YouTube video about, uh, it's called The Nail. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yes, please have describe you seen it. it? I have, uh, it's one of my favorite internet memes, but let's describe it and then we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> it's, it's just most fun. And it, it describes a lot and, describes a lot of the relationships we have as 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 husband and wife maybe or whatever at least it, it did come into my life in that environment <laughs> so you have this you have this couple having a conversation on a couch and the, the woman talking about i think her her headaches and her recurrent headaches and the guy is trying to point out to her things continuously continuously and initially in the video, you see the the woman from just from the backside. You don't see her face. You see her from, from behind. And she's complaining about these headaches. And the guy is trying to point out that there is this nail in her forehead. And that, you know, we if we could just take out the <laughs> nail. And she's trying to tell him that she just wants him to listen to her. So it's just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, people have to see it and then people will understand. But I think that is also what frustrates me often is this, this inability to be able to fix it or to get it done. And that leads to frustration and unhappiness as well, whether it is personal or professional life. Now, I love that video. I, of course, I interpreted the point of that video that that they should just let you remove the nail and things will get better. <laughs> yeah, but no, she just wants to have her story. But like you and I look at it, just get rid of the damn nail. Your problem will be solved. Don't moan yeah. about it. But that's not what she's after. 
But I, I mean, that thing about, you know, happiness is reality minus expectations. I think it, it comes back in a lot of things, whether it is what we just talked about, but also veterinary business and how you develop your business. And if you look at having happy clients and that is, you know, looking at what is their expectation of your service compared to the reality that you can give them. And we see it a lot when, when clients are not happy about mostly clients are not happy about communication around the service and the financial aspects and the financial aspects are generally well if you've been quoted a, a thousand bucks for something and it ends up being 1500 then you're not going to be happy if you had been told initially it's going to be 1500 and it ends up being 1400 you're going to be very happy if you go into a business and you ask for for a service, service your car, and they say it's going to be done at five, and you come at five, and they, they tell you, oh no, we didn't have the time. It's going to be tomorrow. You're not going to be happy. If they had told you from the get go that the car would only be done tomorrow, you would be happy. So, from a business perspective, that equation is also very important in looking at if my clients are not happy. If I get comments, is that because there is a discrepancy between expectations and reality and an expectation that I have created to them that I have not met. I've heard the same thing being said about, because people talk about the massive staff retention crisis. And I, I've, I don't know if it was a study or just a conversation, but I saw feedback from new graduate employees at Virgin Clinics. One of the main reasons why they leave is expectations not being met. Not that it was too busy or something like that, but they were promised you're going to have all this support, you're going to have this and this and this, and then the reality meant that it wasn't met, and then then they wanted to leave because they said, "Well, I wasn't, my expectations weren't met." Yeah, and and that has been for from an employment point of view, in a, in many places that Gabby and I have been, and most particularly our last experience in Germany for that big corporate was that the terms under which we were hired were absolutely not what we got and and the job was a fine job in in a way but it didn't totally didn't meet the expectations that we had negotiated and then it does become unhappiness so i can see where you're coming from when you say and and it's very difficult in trying to attract and retain people because obviously when you attract vets you're trying to oversell a little bit like you know you're not putting an advert up long crappy hours in crappy old <laughs> building with disgruntled old nurses looking after you um, <laughs> you don't advertise that so but i think that the, what i see the we have difficulties attracting vets but we have much more difficulties retaining vets and that is something we have much more power to actually do something about than attracting them because retaining them you're close to them i could talk to you all day man we need to do another this is a it's very insightful and um, you've obviously learned a lot you Smarter beyond your two specializations, you're also very wise. And uh, I think we need to start wrapping up though. Otherwise, we'll be busy for, for days and days. <laughs> we will, we will. Let's do the wrap-up questions. Do we start with the, with the, the pass-along question first? The, the one, with, we're trying the new thing where I get the guest to ask a question that I need to ask the next guest. So first, I'm going to start with the question from one of our previous guests. And the question is... There's a classic question, but there's a twist to this one, which I really like. The classic question is, if you were not a vet or in the vet profession, what would you have done? But added to that is, if somebody comes to you with a, it's like the, the red pill, blue pill scenario, take the red pill, the other job that you would have potentially done, take this pill and it'll change and tomorrow you'll wake up and that will be your career. But you will lose all of the experiences and knowledge that you've gained in your veteran career. Do you take the pill? So A, what, a, what is the, the other career? And B, would you make that switch? Uh, yeah, I think I would. Um, obviously, if you, that depends if you say, like, would you start from scratch again or would you have the, 
the same type of knowledge, but in a totally different area. I think that if I hadn't had such supportive parents that dragged me through and pushed me through my teenage mishaps in high school and, and eventually bared with me with my, my initial struggles at vet school, I would have probably ended up in the hospitality environment. I used to do a lot of work in catering and restaurants and bars and nightclubs and things like that. So as a young 20 year, I, I even would do catering services. I would organize dinner parties for people at home and cook in their kitchen and things like that. So I would definitely have found a nice career likely in cooking or, or restaurant business or any other hospitality. But if I was to choose now, I'd probably go in horticulture. Gabby and I used to have a flower business in Denmark. We sold tulips and all sorts of other bulb flowers as an import business from the Netherlands as a, as a side thing. Was this while you were specializing and raising children? You also sold flowers on the side. Yes, yes. Oh, my word. <laughs> no, I was a specialist already, but and, um, we, I was an associate professor at Copenhagen University in that time, and, and we had a little flower business. And I really have a passion for, for bulbs and flowers. It's one of the biggest disappointments in Australia is the cost of flowers, which is ridiculously high compared to what it is elsewhere but i would i would see myself having a life and i would definitely take that red pill or blue pill or whatever pill and have something to do with with the flowers that's for sure i can find peace and happiness amongst flowers and gardens and things like that it certainly smells better than the inside of a horse's abdomen <laughs> right definitely <laughs> <laughs> All right, Denis, um podcasts. Do you listen to podcasts? And if you do, what should I be listening to? I do listen to podcasts. I listen to yours, so you should listen to yours every now and then. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I, I do listen to yeah, quite a few of them, and I'm mostly interested in those that have to do with human behavior. There is one that I believe somebody in one of your podcasts brought up and it's called Hidden Brain, which is about, yeah, things that happen in our brain, Hidden Brain, which I like a lot. I listen to the TED Talks daily or several from the TED Talk education and, and these kind of things. I listen to one that's called Sexology as well, which is also about, obviously, about, about sex, but also about human and, and relational behaviors within that area that I find quite fascinating and interesting. And then I listened to a couple that would maybe suit you, but unlikely our other audiences, because they are Dutch spoken from Flemish radio that are more about news facts and also some of about human behavior and, and human psychology. So Ooh, I should give that a try. I wonder if I would be able to understand enough to, actually, especially if it's complicated concepts, probably, probably not quite, but it should be a good challenge. You should send me a link to your favorite one and I'll see if I, I'll give it a, make a challenge, a mental challenge for myself. Well, the one that was my favorite one was is, is actually uh, they stopped after ten years, which was called uh, interne kitchen or internal kitchen, um, and they were mostly discussing nonfiction books. And in the nonfiction book series, there was often a lot of human psychology behavior, but also politics or things like that, or historical facts that would come over. But they've unfortunately stopped after 10 years, but there's still 10 years of material to listen to. All right. And then your, oh, wait, I never asked you, what's your question for the next guest? Well, I hope the next guest is someone with a lot of experience and a long career, because I would wonder if he or she was to restart its career, his or her career, as a fresh graduate with the knowledge and experience and skills they have now, 
how do they see the choices they have made being different with that knowledge and skills they have? That's a good one. Okay. And then the last question, the lecture or the event where you have all the veteran new grads of the world, and they want to know a little bit of advice from Dr. Denis. What is your bit of advice? Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. I don't consider myself the smartest one in the room, neither does Gabby, if I can allow myself to talk in her place. But we've <laughs> kept with it. We have kept with it. And if I compare, we, we I had somebody I used to co-house with as a student in Ghent. And she kept on failing her exams and she kept on convincing herself that she was working hard, but she really didn't. She was just not putting in the hours. She was not putting in the effort. And so my advice there is it's the, there's this Dutch expression that you may know and able to translate better than I can is the aanhouder wind. The, the Aanhouder is the one that persists, will win. Oh, yeah. Anhouder win. In Afrikaans, we call it Anhouder win. Exactly. Anhouder win. And if you, and I've said it before in our interview, is what doesn't kill you make you stronger. And again, happiness is reality minus expectations. If you decide to go into whatever, whether it's specialist track and things like that, and your expectation is, is that you're going to get it without a fight, it's not going to work. You're not going to be happy. If you're wanting something, you're going to have to put in the effort. And it's okay if that's not what you want to do. It's okay. Everything is okay. But if, if there is something you want, then it's going to come at a certain price. Always, always. Denis, you're an absolute legend. Thank you so much for, for reaching <laughs> out to talk to us on the Vet Files about some very, very topic topics that we haven't discussed yet and, and you have some incredible insights into it. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for your generous time. How are you feeling about work for the year ahead? We started this podcast to help you find ways to make your vet degree and the career you build around it fit with the life you want to live. Or if that's too ambitious, then at the very least, to make work not suck. And I personally thought that the answers to a fulfilling, happy career as a vet lay in personal growth and better workplaces and all of the other non-clinical stuff that we talk about. Which is true, but something that surprised me when we started doing the clinical podcasts was how big a role that played in my personal enjoyment of work. And judging by the feedback we get from our listeners, it's a common occurrence. Here's why I think it is. It sucks to feel in the dark with your cases, to feel green or rusty in your knowledge. You feel guilty because you feel like you should know more and you should be learning more, but you're also trying to have a life outside of it. So ongoing learning falls by the wayside. On the flip side, it's a really nice feeling to know your stuff. When you get that case, to know the answer, or, if there isn't an answer, to know that it's not because of your lack of knowledge. It's just one of those cases. Competence breeds confidence, and confidence is key. And our clinical podcast is the easiest way to work on your competence. Little bits of growth, every week, with minimal effort on your part. Try it. It works. Join our growing community of Vetfeld nerds and get your mojo back at vvn.supercast.com.